Section three of Magna Carta Commemoration Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Spiegel. Innocent the Third and the Great Charter by Professor G. B. Adams, Ph.D. That John expected the Pope to release him from his obligation to the Charter upon some ground or other is, I think, reasonably certain. That the Pope honestly believed that he was acting with complete authority in doing so is even more clear from the evidence. But no attempt has ever been made, so far as I am aware, to show by an analysis of the evidence upon what basis of legal right the Pope supposed he was resting his bull of 24 August 1215 or to subject his right to annul the charter to a legal criticism. I can hope in this paper to do no more than to make a beginning in that direction. To determine the legal basis of the Pope's action, one turns first of all to the bull itself, but the answer which it gives is too indefinite to be satisfactory. One naturally expects to find the Pope's action based upon the vassal relation of England to the papacy. This relationship is indeed clearly mentioned in the bull, but it is not emphasized. It is put forward as one fact among others, explaining the Pope's interest in the case, but his interest in the fact that John was a crusader is more strongly insisted on. Nowhere is the feudal relationship asserted as the ground of right on which the Pope was acting, nor is there any attempt made to show that the charter reduced the value of the fief, or its ability to perform the service by which it was held, nor are these facts even asserted. In the formal phrases of annulling at the close of the bull, it is the apostolic authority which is put forward, and there is no mention of the feudal relationship. So far as the language of the bull is concerned, there is nothing in it to prevent our saying that, if the relationship had not existed, the Pope would have taken the same action. If now we turn from the bull to the other contemporary evidence, documentary and chronicle, which has come down to us, the information we gain is no more definite, but certain things bearing on the question stand out rather clearly. 1. The feudal dependency of England upon the papacy was recognized by all parties during the whole period, with the single exception of Philip II of France and his son, in their debate with the Pope. They, however, do not deny the fact of the relationship, but the right of John to enter into it and its legality. John, of course, makes the matter entirely clear in his two charters, recording his oath of fiality of 15 May and 3 October 1215. He there calls England for the first time, patrimonium beati petri, a phrase recurring again in connection with the charter. In his letters, in 1215, John also refers frequently and clearly to the relationship, as does also the Pope, and the phrase patrimonium petri occurs several times. Too much emphasis has, I think, been placed upon the barons' recognition of the vassal relationship in their letter to the Pope in February 1215, for rhetorical purposes merely, but they certainly do recognize it, according to the statement of John's envoy. 2. In certain cases, John had acted, or seems at first sight to have acted, as the Pope's vassal. 1. He sought a confirmation from the Pope of his grant of freedom of election to the churches of 15 January 1215. That this is the act of a feudal vassal seeking a confirmation from his lord of a grant which would be invalid without it is exceedingly doubtful. It probably would have been sought in any case. The prelates would naturally desire this sanction added to the king's grant. The confirmation is Actoritata Apostolica Confirmamus, and there is no reference in it to the feudal relationship nor to the feudal rights. The language of all the clauses of confirmation and sanction follows closely the model which had long been in use in the papal chancery for similar confirmations issued in large numbers to monasteries and churches with reference to lands and rights by whomsoever given. It is not possible to cite this case as evidence of action upon feudal principles. 2. Confirmation was also sought from the Pope of the arrangement made with Berengaria in 1215 in regard to her dower rights. In this case the papal confirmation is lacking, though one was sent to Berengaria in answer to her request and one was, no doubt, sent to John. We have, however, John's requests, two separate requests of even date, in regard to the two distinct agreements. In these no reference is made directly or indirectly to the feudal position of the Pope. 
In the one which concerns the main agreement, there is no request for confirmation, but, in the language of the agreement, the Pope is asked, Ut presenti compositioni adat securitatis quas veredit expiride, et nos retum habibimus quince quid indi stadureat. In the second the word confirmat is used, but clearly not in a technical sense, and the meaning of this request is the same as in the first, not that the Pope will make legal something which is otherwise beyond the capacity of the contracting party, but that he will add further, unknown, sanctions to the agreement. This is quite in accordance with what would at any time be normal, considering the question between the parties and the Pope's earlier interest in the case. In a letter on the subject addressed to John in 1207, he had clearly stated the grounds of his right to act in the case, his special duty towards widows, and commanded, mandamus, him to represent, in presentia nostra, what he was going to do. This case is also clearly non-feudal. 3. In his letter of 29 May 1215, John said that he had declared to the barons that his land was the patrimony of St. Peter, held of him and of the Roman Church and of the Pope, that he emphasized to them his obligations and claimed his privileges as a crusader, and then appealed through the earls of Pembroke and Warren against the disturbers of the peace of the land. Roger of Wendover states that John's messengers to the Pope, presumably those whom he says the king sent soon after granting the charter, in the account of events which they gave to the Pope, mentioned an appeal by the king before the entry of the barons into London. In his bull of 24 August, the Pope says that John had twice appealed to him. There is no further evidence for these statements, but there is no reason to doubt them. It should be noted that they give us no clear evidence of the ground on which the appeal was made. 4. Roger of Wendover, in the account just referred to, makes the king's envoys say that at some indefinite time before the granting of the charter, John publicly protested before the barons that, because the kingdom of England belonged to the Roman Church, Rationi Dominii, he could not and ought not to decree anything new without the consent of the Pope, nor to change anything in the kingdom to his prejudice. This same statement is also made by the Pope in the bull of 24 August. Here clearly is an appeal to feudal law. The Pope's attention was called to a principle upon which he might act against the charter, and that principle was clearly in his mind when the bull was drawn up. Nevertheless, it was not made the basis of the Pope's action. In regard to the point of law, we may so far anticipate the latter discussion as to say that, in the first part of his statement, John was quite wrong, and in the second, more nearly right. 5. In the bull of 24 August, the Pope says that after offering to the barons, Secundum formum mandati nostri justitii plenidudinum exhibiri, which they refused, the king ad audientium nostrum appellans obtulit eis exhibiri justitiam coram nobis, ad quos hujus causae juditium rationi dominii pertinibat. This is the first appeal mentioned by the Pope, and if the appeals have been correctly indicated in three above, it is the one made through the earls of Pembroke and Warren. In his letter, 29 May, John, in mentioning this appeal, does not add these legal particulars, and the source of the Pope's information is not evident. Judging by his general practice, however, he was probably following English information from some source. It is also quite possible that John, in order to confuse the situation, may have made an appeal in some such terms. It is out of the question, however, that any practical result should follow from such an appeal or that it should be legally defensible. It is theoretically possible that the Pope could create a lay court of peers for the trial of an appeal by John, but not actually possible. The King of Sicily was in the midst of his campaign for the throne of Germany. The King of Aragon was a minor. The Pope's royal vassals in Hungary and the Balkans could hardly be expected to appear in Rome for such a purpose. A lay court of the Pope's vassals in Rome and its neighborhood could easily have been called together, but it would hardly have been a court of the peers of John. In relation to him, they would be in the position of those who held in England ut de honore instead of ut de corona. The legal difficulties are equally formidable. The language used by the Pope plainly implies a judicial proceeding. If the Pope states the facts correctly, and the evidence goes to show that he did, on the arrival in England of his letter of 29 March, John offered to the barons, quod in curia sua per peres irum secundum legum et consuetidinus regni suborta dissensio superitur. This, however, would not be a suit at law. With reference to the barons' complaints, the king would be in the position of a defendant, 
but as king he could not be sued. He states the situation with technical correctness in his letter of 29 May, which is probably the source of the Pope's information. He says, Et praeteria eis optilimus, quod de omnibus petitionibus suus, per consideratium parium, suroum justitiae, plenitudium eis exhibirimus. That is, the baron's case could come before the curia regis only by way of petition, and the answer would be a matter of equity. That is, an act of the curia as council, not as court, if we may make a distinction perfectly valid in 1215, but which perhaps the men of the day could not have drawn. In such a case, John could have no appeal to his suzerain on technical grounds. Every action of the council was technically his action, and no decision of the whole baronage against him would have any legal validity if he withheld the rexcabot. The only technical appeal possible would be by the barons. They, however, refused the king's offer, and then John appealed, on what grounds we do not know. It could not have been on grounds of legal technicality, but the general appeal to his lord for protection was always open to him, though it could have been made in this case only by a quibble. Equally difficult is the Pope's statement that John offered to do the barons justice before him to whom hujus causae judicium rationi dominii pertinebat. In the relation of England to the papacy, no right of judgment pertained to the Pope, rationi dominii, except in the cases brought before him by way of appeal. It is necessary to say that the Pope is here using language which is apparently technical, but which cannot be justified on such grounds, but only if it is regarded as used in the most general and non-technical sense. John's curia was as fully competent to judge finally every case between the king and the barons after as before he became the vassal of the Pope, and without any reference to his overlord. His position was not that of an English vassal of the king, but that of one of the sovereign great barons of France, and, under the terms by which the fief was held, he could not even be called up for court service as a matter of right. 3. Although John calls attention several times to his feudal relation to the Pope, and seems disposed to make what he can of it, he clearly does not trust to it as sufficient. On 4 March 1215, he took the cross, thereby gaining the ecclesiastical protection and extensive privileges granted to the crusader, but also securing the interest of the Pope in regard to the plans which Innocent had most deeply at heart. In this new relationship, John undoubtedly secured all that he needed, and the skillful use which he could make of it is shown in his letter of 29 May, in which he puts the situation in such a light as to make clear to the Pope his inability to take any steps towards the crusade because of the trouble the barons were making. On this ground alone, the Pope would undoubtedly have felt himself justified by existing law and practice in acting as he did. Not merely did the privileges granted crusaders relieve them from contracts which interfered with the carrying out of their vows, but the popes assumed the right to protect a crusade and crusaders from any interference with the undertaking. In his excommunication of the crusaders of the fourth crusade for their attack on Zara, Innocent based his action wholly on ecclesiastical grounds, and did not allude to the fact that the king of Hungary, whose territory was thus violated, was his vassal whom he would be bound to protect in the possession of his fief. 4. According to Roger of Wendover's account of the embassy to the Pope soon after the granting of the charter, Innocent was informed that the barons had demanded quasdem legis et libertatis iniquias quas dignitatum regium nulli duciet confirmeri. The same chronicler informs us that John, angry at the demands of the barons, presented in their preliminary schedule, cried out, et quare cum istis iniquius exectionibus barons not postulat regnum and attributes a similar exclamation to Innocent when certain clauses of the charter were shown him in writing. If these statements refer to specific demands, it would be exceedingly interesting to know which ones they were. If regarded as intended to furnish a legal basis in feudal law for the Pope's action against the charter, they are certainly much too strong for anything which it contains. The only clauses which demanded extreme concessions from the king, I have discussed elsewhere sufficiently, I think, to show that, taken altogether, they would not justify such statements. If, finally, we turn to feudal law, as understood either in England or upon the continent, to inquire if, by its principles alone, the Pope would have been justified in annulling the charter, the answer must be, I think, in the negative. The details of the law which would apply to the case differed in different countries, but the underlying principle was the same everywhere. Without the Lord's consent, the vassal might do nothing with or in his fief, which reduced its value to himself to such an extent as to endanger his ability to perform the service by which he held it. 
In some cases this principle was extended to mean that no reduction, however small, like the emancipation of a serf, could be made in the capital, or permanent, value of the fief, undoubtedly with reference to the possibility of escheat, as is stated in the English statute of Mortmain. In applying this principle to the case of Innocent the Third and John, it must first of all be remembered that John did not hold England by indefinite feudal or by military tenure, but by a clearly defined money payment only. That is, England was a feudium sensuale, which is the term applied by Innocent to the exactly similar relation of Aragon to the papacy. In both John's charters of 1213, making the concession to the Pope, and in the Pope's acceptance of 2nd November 1213, the money payment is distinctly said to be pro omni servicio et consuetudina, quad pro ipsis farcera de merimas, saving St. Peter's pence. This definition of the service is perfectly clear and normal, and it limits not merely John's obligations, but also the Pope's rights. Under it the Pope would be in duty bound to protect the king in the possession of his fief against any outside attack or any internal revolution which would deprive him of it, but he could find no ground in feudal law on which he could object to any arrangement entered into by his vassal for its internal management which did not seriously affect his ability to pay the specified annual sum. If all the financial clauses of the charter being put together and interpreted as they must have been understood in 1215, the absurdity of supposing that they would justify the annulling of the charter by the overlord would be apparent. But the Pope and the King apparently understood the weakness of such a case, notwithstanding John's extreme statements and the Pope's seeming endorsement of them. Neither of them trusted the feudal relationship as a sufficient ground of action against the charter, and the fact accounts for John's assumption of the cross and for the way in which the Pope passed over his feudal rights in the bull of 24 August. It is upon his ecclesiastical rights that Innocent founded his action, and upon them alone. Appendix The Pope's letter of 18 June 1215, to which reference is made above, is in the Public Record Office, Popple Bills, Box 52, Number 2. The upper left-hand corner has been destroyed at some time in the past, so that the entire address and portions of diminishing length of the first ten lines have been lost, and a single word and portions of words, as indicated in the text, have been lost elsewhere in the letter. The lines contain an average of 202 letter and word spaces. The address was probably general to the people of England. The letter seems to have special reference to John's letter to the Pope of 29 May, and in the first portion it follows rather closely the Pope's letters of 19 March. The text was printed by Pyrene in his History of King John, 1670, page 27, who supplied the address, Innocentius Episcopus, Nobilibus Virus, Universitate Baronum Angliae, Hanc Paginum Inspecturus, Salutum et Apostolicum, Benedictionum, which can hardly be correct, and portions of the missing words, distinguishing his editions in two cases only. Modern historians have mostly not noticed its existence. Ramsey, Agavine Empire, page 486, note 1, refers to Pyrene's text, reference a misprint, and says the letter does not read quite like one of Innocent's utterances. Gasquet, Henry III in the Church, pages 13 to 15, gives a reference to the original, says it was addressed to Langton and the other English bishops, which it certainly was not, and gives an otherwise inaccurate abstract of its contents. There is no reference to it in Potast. As the letter is highly characteristic of the method in which the papal letters were composed during this conflict, and may be called in some respects a first draft of the bull of 24 August, it seems worthwhile to print it in a new and more accessible edition. A comparison of the text with that of the other letters, papal and royal, of the crisis, beginning with that to the Eustace de Vinci of 5 November 1214, Reimer, Roman at 1, 126, will show the characteristic borrowing of phrases of which I have spoken. I have referred in the notes by date to some of the more important or interesting cases. It will be noticed that in this letter the Pope says that he has given directions to the Archbishop and his suffragans to excommunicate the barons unless within eight days they come to an agreement with the king according to the form which he had earlier recommended to their messengers. The only papal letter which we have corresponding to this statement is the bull Miramur Purimum, preserved without date by Roger of Wendover, Romanet three, three thirty six. The dating of this bull is admittedly difficult. 
Its place among the events of Roger of Wendover's narrative can give us no clue. In Walter of Coventry, Romanet 2, 223, a bull of similar purport is said to have been shown to the bishops at a meeting at Oxford on 16 August. It is dated by Pottshast, number 4992, and of August, and most modern historians have accepted Walter of Coventry's date as that at which it was presented. Sir James Ramsay, Avignon Empire, page 478, concludes against August in favor of 16 July. The most serious objection to considering the bull, Miramur Pirimum, to be the one referred to in the letter of 18 June, is the definite statement that the barons were to be allowed an interval of eight days in which to come to an agreement with the king. That statement is not in the bull, Miramur Pirimum. It may have been contained in a supplementary letter, or have been committed to the messengers to be made known orally, as not quite consonant with the dignity of a formal papal command. It should be noticed that the bull shows no knowledge of the charter. I am inclined to believe that it should be dated 18 June, and the meeting at which it was shown to the bishops, 16 July, although I am not prepared to assert this definitely. Text of the Pope's Letter of 18 June Blank Partibus Angliae Nupa Auribus Nostris Blank Odo regni Angliae, sed etiam aliorum, blank, quostam inter eos et carissimum, blank, opus eset cum humilitate ac devotione repetere, blank, super hoc iidem barones suos ad nos nuntios destinasent, ut nos ve, blank, de dicemus literis in preceptis, ut conspirationes et coniurationes presumptas ad tempore suborte discordiae inter regnum et sacerdotium apostolica de nu blank es ne talia de cetero temptarentur in jungerent baronibus ante dictis ut per devotionis et humilitatis indicia tam animum regis placare quam recon blank es quod ab eo ducerent postulandum conservando sibi regalem honorem et exhibendo servitia debita quibus ipse rex non debebat absque judicio spoliari ac in super blank prefatam in remissione sibi pecaminum in jungendo Quatinus benigne per tractans nobiles ante dictos, justas petitiones eorum clementa admitteret, plena eis in uniendo morando et recedendo secu, blank, essa pariter atque data. Ita quod si forte non posset inter eos concordia provenire, in curia sua per pares eorum secundum regni consuetudines atque leges mota deberet dissensio terminari. Barones ipsi nostro non expectato responso, postquam idem rex signum crucis assumpsit in subsidium terre sancte. Contempta justitia quam ipse rex superabundante offerebat eistem contra dominum suum arma movere temeritate nefaria presumpsurunt non timentes taliter crucis negotium impedire ac regni periculum procurare cum pecuniam quam proliberatione terre sancte deberet expendere in destructionem etiam terre sue profundere compelatur Quodque nefandum est et absurdum, cum ipse rex quasi perversus deum et ecclesiam offendebat, illi assistebant eidem. Cum autem conversus deo et ecclesiae satisfecit, ipsum impugnare presumunt. Sic que videtur quod conspirationem inherent detestandam, ut eum taliter de regno possint eicere. Hominio et fidelitate sibi prestitis penitus violatis. 
quod quam crudele sit actu et horrendum auditu cum peniciosi exempli materia sit et causa nostris temporibus in audita manifeste conoscit qui cumque judicio utitur rationis unde valde dolendum existit cum hoc in inuriam sumi dei ecclesiae romane ac nostrum contemptum regis et regni opprobrium et periculum et terre sancte ad cuius subsidium se devoverat rex prefatus nimium detrimentum redundat cum igitur debeamus et libente velimus pacem regni angliae procurare ipsius tubationes propellere ac dicti regis qui vasalus noster existit conservare justitias et inurias propulsare maxime cum idem propter caracterem crucis assumptum specialiter sub nostra protectione consistat prefatis archiepiscopo et suffragani seus in obedientiae virtute districte dedimus in preceptis quatinus nisi prefati barones infra octo dies post susceptionem literarum nostrarum ab eis vel aliquo ipsorum diligente ammoniti recipiarent et servaverent formam descriptam superius a nobis nuntiis eorum presentibus cum multa deliberatione provisam idem omni cavillatione post posita eos et fautores ipsorum sublato cuius libet contradictionis et appellationis obstaculo excommunicationis mucrone percellant et terracilorum ecclesiastico subiciant interdicto facientes utramque sententiam per totam angliam singulis diebus dominicis et festivis solemniter publicari ne igitur propter quostam perversos universitatis sinceritas in anglia corrumpatur quae hactenus ab infidelitatis contagio fuit prosus immunis universitati vestri per apostolica scripta precipiendo mandamus et in remissionem in jungimus peccatorum quatinus prefato regi adversus perversores huius modi opportunum impendatis auxilium et favorem ita quod in confusionem ipsius et aliorum regnorum non posit tanta nequitia prevalere sed tempestate sedata regnum ipsum optata tranquillitate letetur scientes procerto quod si rex ipse remissus esset aut tepidus in hac parte nos regnum angliae non pateremur ad tantam ignominiam et willitatem deduci cum sciamus per dei gratiam et pusumus talium insolentiam castigare dat terentin ante diem quator decim calendus julii pontificatus nostri anno octavo decimo an endorsement in a later but thirteenth century hand possibly not much later than the original reads in octe turbactione orta interregum one et baronis angliae verbum ultimum compentis est examinator end of section three